Hello. This is part 5 of my video tutorial series about switched mode power supplies. I dealt with various non-switching converter topologies as well as with a charge pump, the buck converter and the boost converter in the first four parts of this series. If you haven't watched them yet, I recommend you to do so. To obtain a deeper understanding of the physical principles behind the workings of the buck and boost converter, as well as to understand upcoming more complicated topologies, this episode will entirely be dedicated to the physics of inductors. This topic is very theoretical and complex in nature. I, however, will do all I can to make the abstract properties of magnetic components as graphic as possible. For that purpose, I have filmed some experiments and provided you with the best drawings I can make. If you find this part too theoretical, however, don't be scared. The following videos will be more practice oriented again. Inductor basics. So, we want to talk about inductive components. But first, there is one important question to answer. What is inductance? Well, there are different ways to define the term. But I will use the following definition. And I want you to keep it in mind. Inductance is the capability of an electronic component or conductor to create a magnetic field when current is flowing through it. Now, based on this definition, I will show you some simple but effective experiments which demonstrate basic properties of inductive components. For the first setup, we have a 12 volt battery acting as a voltage source. Via two copper wires in a switch, it is connected to two light bulbs which are connected in parallel. The first light bulb is rated for 50 watts at 12 volts, while the second one is rated for 20 watts at 12 volts. They simply act as a resistive load for an output power of around 70 watts. The copper wires are placed within some distance to each other and, in addition, a compass is brought near to one of the wires. Here you see the real-life setup. On the left the battery, on the right the two light bulbs, up here the switch and down here you see the compass which is, for this experiment, placed directly under one of the wires. The DMM, by the way, is measuring the current flowing through the circuit. Now watch what happens as I close the switch. As you can see, a current of around 5.8 amperes has started flowing through the circuit. The compass needle has moved quite a bit, with the north pole of the needle pointing away from us, clearly indicating that a measurable magnetic field was created around the copper wire. And as I open the switch, that magnetic field vanishes again. So, to remember this later, I call this our lesson 1. Even a simple piece of wire creates a magnetic field when current passes through it and has thus an inductance. If I now put the compass over rather than directly under the wire and activate the switch, see what happens. The compass is coming in motion again but is now pointing towards us. Why is that? Well, it indicates that the magnetic field is not radiating away from the conductor, but that the magnetic field lines exist in closed loops around the conductor. It also shows that the magnetic field lines clearly have a direction. If the direction of the electrical current flowing through the conductor is known, the direction of the field lines can be determined by the right-hand rule in this way. The thumb of your right hand points in the direction of the technical current flow, while your remaining fingers indicate the direction of the field lines around the conductor. I sum this up to lesson 2. The magnetic field is a directed vectorial quantity, but the magnetic field lines do not radiate away from the conductor, but form a closed loop around it. The direction in which the field lines point can be determined by the right-hand rule. 
To underline that last point, I will now twist the two copper wires of our circuit together and will then repeat the experiment. Now watch what happens as I close the switch again. The light bulb slide up. The current is as high as before, but the reaction of the compass needle is only minute. What would be the reason for that? Well, it helps to make a little drawing here. What you see here is a cross section of the two copper wires. The direction of the current flow can be marked by adding a dot in the middle of one and a cross in the middle of the other wire's cross section. The cross means that the current flowing in the left copper wire is flowing away from you, while the point means that the current in the right wire is flowing towards you. You can memorize the meaning of this convention often used in physics lectures by imagining a real-life arrow with a cross of feathers at its back and a round pointy arrowhead at the front end. If you now apply the right hand rule and add the field lines created around the two wires, you can see that because the two conductors are so near to each other, most of the field lines are opposed to each other. That means that the two magnetic fields created by the two conductors are to a big portion cancelling each other out. From a practical standpoint, that means that the inductance of the twisted pair is much lower than the inductance of the two wires when they have a large distance between them. We can sum this up in lesson 3. When two magnetic fields are being generated in the same space, but are opposed in direction, they can cancel each other out. This is utilized, for example, when wires are wound in twisted pairs. Now I return to the two separated wires again. But this time I place the compass further away from the wire. As I now activate the switch, a rearrangement of the compass needle can be seen. But obviously the reaction is much weaker than before. Lesson 4 is then, the magnetic field is strongest close to the conductor and loses strength as the distance is increased. This is visualized as a lower density of field lines. Now we return to the original setup, where the compass was placed directly under one of the wires. But this time we will gradually decrease the load and thus also decrease the current through the wire. We will do this by first removing the 20 watt bulb, then replacing the 50 watt bulb by the 20 watt bulb, which we will finally replace by a 1.2 watt bulb. As we do that, we will clearly see a drop of current as measured by the DMM. But what is more interesting is to watch how the compass reacts. Here we see the reaction with the entire 70 watt load again. Now with 50 watt load. Now with 20 watt load. And now with 1.2 watt load. As you can see, a decrease in current through the wire results also in a decrease in the strength of the magnetic field. And so we can formulate lesson 5. The magnetic field strength is a function of the current flowing through the conductor. A higher electric current results in a higher strength of the magnetic field. So, as you can see, even with an instrument as simple as a compass, many properties of magnetic fields can be explored. Roughly 200 years ago, the Danish physicist Johann Christian Ørsted performed similar experiments as we did just now. And yet, most human beings today know as little about electromagnetism as people did in 1820. Just think about that for a moment. But for the experiment that follows now, we will lay the compass aside and will instead use this modern digital LCR meter to measure the inductance of different conductors and components. As we learned in lesson 1, even a simple piece of wire must have an inductance. But how high will that inductance be in actual numbers? 
Well, let's try and measure. As you can see, the LCR meter measures an inductance value of 0.4 microhenries, which equals to 400 nanohenries or 4 times 10 to the power of minus 7 henries. This is a very small inductance and it is the lower end of what can be technically controlled by simple means. I now wound the same piece of wire into a tiny roughly cylindrical air coil with 8 turns in total. Let's measure the inductance again. As you can see, the inductance has gone up to a value of around 0.6 microhenries. Still a very small value, but nonetheless a clear increase in inductance. Next I will take this half of a 3 legged ferrite core and put the air coil over its middle leg. If you wonder what ferrite is, be patient, I will explain it later. By measuring the inductance again, we can see that it has further increased to a value of around 4 microhenries. Now I take the other half belonging to the core and put it on top of the first one. Now let's see what we get. As you can see, the inductance has gone up to a staggering 170 microhenries. Now I apply some pressure to the upper half of the core with this plastic rod and measure the inductance again. And the inductance has again increased. All in all, the same wire wound around the ferrite core has now reached an inductance hundreds of times bigger than the initial value. So, how can all this be explained? Well, the first thing to explain would be why the inductance of a wound air coil is higher than that of a straight piece of copper wire. Like in the case of the twisted pair, it helps to make a drawing here. In the cross section of the coil, we can see that the magnetic field lines created around the wire point all in the same direction inside as well as outside the coil. The field lines are interlinked. And just as the magnetic fields of the twisted pair cancel each other out, the magnetic fields of the coil add up. Therefore, we can formulate lesson 6. When a conductor is wound in turns, forming a coil, the magnetic field lines pointing in the same direction add up. This results in the higher inductance of a coil opposed to a straight conductor. But why did the inductance go up a bit when the half piece of the ferrite core was added to the air coil? And why did it increase even more with the two complete halves at work? Well, there is one model used in electrical engineering which allows an intuitive understanding of these principles. It's called the magnetic circuit. The magnetic circuit is an analogy to the electric circuit and that's why I'll try to explain them side by side. The electric circuit. Inside a voltage source electric charges are separated from one another so that they have a so-called potential difference or voltage with respect to one another. By the separation process, an electric field with the electric field strength E is created between the two electrodes of the source. When a piece of material with a certain conductivity sigma, length L and cross section area A is connected to the source, that same electric field created by the source also exists across this piece of conductor, which we call a resistor. But nature always strives after an equilibrium. And that's why charges begin to flow from one pole to the other in the attempt to equalize the potentials at the two electrodes. These moving charges are what we call electric current. Now, as Ohm's law teaches us, the three quantities, voltage, resistance and currents in electric circuits, directly influence one another in the following way. V equals R times I, which is equivalent to I equals V over R. The inverse value of the resistance R is the so-called conductance G, which, as you will see, is better suited to express the analogy I want to point out here. The conductance measured in Siemens is expressing virtually the same property of a conductor or resistor as the resistance in ohms does only that here a high value means that the resistor is actually a good and not a bad conductor. 
So with g being 1 over r, it follows that i equals v times g, meaning that both an increase in the source voltage or an increase in the load resistor's conductance leads to an increase in the current through the circuit. If we now try to see the resistor as a three-dimensional physical object, we can define its conductance as follows. g equals sigma times a over l. The conductance g of a resistor is the product of the material's conductivity sigma times its cross-section area a divided by its length l, meaning that a resistor will conduct the electrical current better if it's short rather than long, has a big cross-section rather than a small one, and is of course made of highly conductive material, like for example copper. This can be summed up in the equation I equals V times sigma times A over L, with which follows that I equals V times sigma times A over L. It all comes down to a very simple conclusion. If you have an electric circuit with a voltage source that delivers a constant supply voltage and a resistor attached to it, the current through it will be big when the resistor is a thick, short piece of highly conductive material. But if you now connect a second load resistor in series that is made of a material of very low conductivity and thus of much lower conductance, the current through the circuit will drop. In fact, the current will almost completely be determined by the properties of the second resistor. You can show this in a very simple example. Let's say you connect a resistor with a resistance of 1 ohms in series with another one with 1 kilo ohms, supplied with a voltage of 12 volts. According to Ohm's law, the current will be around 11.99 milliamperes. That's nearly the same value as if you would only have the 1K resistor alone, which would give you exactly 12 milliamperes. We can sum this up to the sentence Every chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Likewise is the current through a circuit limited by the series resistor with the lowest conductance, or in other words, highest resistance. Now that this should be understood, we can finally talk about the magnetic circuit. For that, let us take a look on this photograph of the ferrite core I used earlier in this video. The coil around the middle leg is attached to a voltage source so that electric current is flowing through it. It is thus, as we saw before, creating a magnetic field with closed field lines. But from this point on, let us even forget that the coil is part of an electric circuit, as we want to talk about magnetism here. Because the coil is generating a magnetic field, we can see it as a magnetic voltage source with a magnetic supply voltage, theta, sometimes also called magnetomotive force. It generates a magnetic field with a magnetic field strength, h. As the field lines wander through the space around the coil, they pass different materials. Here, basically the air around the coil, as well as the ferrite the core is made of. Now, just as with the electric circuit, a current is starting to flow. This magnetic current is called the magnetic flux phi, but because every turn of the inductor is generating its own phi, we call the totality of all the individual fluxes the interlinked magnetic flux psi, with psi equaling phi times n, with n being the number of turns. And just as every material has a certain conductivity for electric current, so do all materials have a conductivity for the magnetic flux. This quantity is called the permeability mu, of a certain material. Now, in analogy to Ohm's law, V equals Ri, we can formulate also a law for the magnetic circuit. It's called Hopkinson's law and it says that Vm equals Rm times Im, or theta equals Rm times phi or, especially for coils, theta equals rm times phi times n equals rm times psi. The magnetic resistance, by the way, is actually called reluctance. And the analogy goes on. Just as electric currents always prefer the path of lowest electrical resistance, 
the magnetic flux always wants to go the way of lowest magnetic reluctance. That means that almost all the field lines are bent and bundled inside the ferrite core, which is made of very high permeability material, while only a few field lines wander through the air, which has a very low magnetic permeability. In almost all cases, however, the absolute value of the magnetic flux will not appear in our equations, but it will be expressed via the so-called magnetic flux density B which basically gives you the flux in relation to the conductive cross-section area it passes through. It's defined in the following way, with B equaling d psi over dA, with psi being the flux through the magnetic circuit and A being the cross-section area of the conductive path inside the coil, and the additional condition that the flux psi is constant over that area, we get B equals psi over A. When inserted into Hopkinson's law, it gives us theta equals rm times b times a. When transposed for b, we get b equals vm over rm times a. And as we did with the resistor inside the electric circuit, we also have to imagine the magnetic reluctance rm as a three-dimensional object with a length l, a cross-section area a, and a magnetic permeability mu. The reluctance can then be expressed as follows. Rm equals L over mu times A, meaning that a piece of matter will be a good conductor for the magnetic flux when it is short of big cross-section area and made of material with high magnetic permeability. With that follows that B equals Vm over L over mu times A, with which follows that B equals Vm times mu times a divided by L. Now as you can see here, the equation for the magnetic flux density in the magnetic circuit is very similar to the equation for the electric current in the electric circuit. If we now additionally define the inductance of a coil as L psi over I equaling B times A over I, we can see that the inductance of a coil is proportional to the magnetic flux generated by the coil when a current is flowing through it. This is the mathematical equivalent of our definition number one from the beginning of the video. We can now try to examine the four cases in which we measured the inductance of the coil earlier in this video. When I first measured the air coil without any core material but the surrounding air, the magnetic field created by the coil was very weak because the field lines were all traveling through low permeability material. Therefore, the coil was not able to generate high magnetic flux. Thus, its inductance was very low. When I put the coil on the middle leg of the one half of the ferrite core, at least a portion of the way that the magnetic field lines had to travel were made of high permeability material. Therefore, the overall magnetic permeability was higher and the coil could generate a higher magnetic flux density. But if you display the setup as a magnetic circuit, you would see that it is the series connection of a very low reluctance supplied by the ferrite and the very high reluctance of the air completing a closed loop. And similar to the electric circuit, the highest magnetic reluctance limits the overall magnetic flux density. When I added the second half of the ferrite core, I virtually closed the magnetic circuit and provided a high permeability path for the magnetic field lines, allowing a drastic increase in the magnetic flux density and thus in the inductance of the coil. But why did the inductance increase again when I pushed the two halves together with a plastic rod? Well, actually, it always remains a small air gap between the two ferrite core halves, which adds additional reluctance in series to the reluctance of the ferrite legs. So, when I press the two halves harder together, I minimize the length of that air gap and thus maximize the inductance of the coil. Okay. So now that we have been talking so much about the magnetic circuit, let us again try to sum the most important insight up to another lesson. In my words, lesson 7 would then be 
When a core made of ferrite or another high magnetic permeability material is added to the air coil, a path which is highly conductive for the magnetic flux is provided. Thus, the inductance of the coil can, in this way, be increased by several orders of magnitude. Actually, I plan to cover even much more in this video, which needs to be known to answer the questions from the end of part 4. But since this is already the longest in the series, I'll have to make yet another video about inductor basics. In the next video I will talk about Faraday's law of induction, the magnetization curve, different magnetic materials including ferrites, and maybe even about transients. Hopefully that will then finally enable us to really understand the boost converter and proceed to the buck boost and flyback converter. By the way, making this video took me 32 hours of writing, sound recording, filming, drawing, editing and experimenting. Not even counted the numerous hours of thinking about how to explain all this. I nonetheless hope to upload the next video as soon as possible. So if you like this video, watch my other videos and please subscribe to my channel.